welcome everyone. So good to have you here on a Wednesday afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm aware there might be a one or two coming in a bit later due to the link, but it's good to see you are all here. Now, as the year goes on, we tend to find our energy depletes. Uh, we've put, we have lots of things that have been going on throughout the year. We have lots of tight deadlines coming in towards Christmas or the end of the finance, uh, sorry, end of the calendar year. And so we tend to find our energy levels are dropping at certain times. But what's really fascinating is we don't really recognize that our energy is dropping so much until it's really too late. Uh, you know, coming from an athletic background, we it was really, really clear when our um, we didn't get recovery right or we had overused our energy because it was a physical response. We could our muscles would be sore, we would be slower, we would react slower, uh, we would make mistakes. So it was really defined black and white when we weren't getting our energy management and our recovery um, correct. But when we move into, say, the corporate world, unless it's a really physical job or you have a catastrophic event, the decline in our energy is very, very slow. It is a mental fatigue more than a physical fatigue. And it's generally so gradual that our body keeps adapting to it. And we don't recognize what's happening until we do this beautiful thing. And that is take a day off. And we have a little bit of rest and our body goes, hey, that's amazing. Why haven't you been doing that? I'm going to punish you so it makes you sick. And so it holds you underwater for a little while and you kind of come up and you feel good for a day. And then it goes, hey, you know what? You haven't learned your lesson yet. I'm going to hold you back down again for a little bit longer until you realize. And so that is the challenge when it comes to burnout and managing our energy in the corporate world, especially if we don't have physical jobs. And so today we're going to look at how can we uh, proactively manage our energy more effectively to prevent burnout. And this is a challenge. It's not super easy. There's no clear pathway to preventing it, but there are certain things we can do and be aware of that can try and prevent us getting to a burnout phase. So let's have a look first at what burnout is. And this is according to the World Health Organization. So according to WHO, the World Health Organization, burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. Okay, not successfully managed. And so let's have a look at what some of the signs are. And here are some of the signs. So from a physical, emotional, and a behavioral perspective, here are some of the signs. From a physical point of view, you could be tired, you could feel your immune system dropping, maybe you are getting a little bit sick. Sometimes we get irregular sleep patterns or even achy bodies. From an emotional perspective, you know, things like we feel a sense of behavior, uh, things like self-doubt, loneliness, maybe detachment from the world or the work that you're doing. We can become very cynical and negative and maybe not even satisfied with the things that we potentially are doing well. And then we have behavioral aspects where we start to avoid responsibilities, maybe procrastinate longer. Uh, we Some people, they go towards food, drug, alcohol sometimes to try and get themselves through this energy depletion because they're kind of looking to pick their energy up quickly. And some avoid work altogether. Uh, which is always a bit of a challenge. Now, for me, recently, I would say that for the very first time in my life, I have got to a point of um, burnout. But I've been able to recognize signs. But I wasn't, I, even though I was recognizing some things happening, I still wasn't taking action. And it took other people outside of me to actually just have a conversation to share something I already knew, but I wasn't doing anything about. And so I have, for those, you know, some of you may know this year, I have a baby girl, she's 10 months old, most beautiful thing in my life, love her to bits and wouldn't change anything. And I have someone who's done a lot of sport in my time and did Ironman triathlons, which, you know, you 
you get yourself into some serious levels of fatigue, but nothing ever compares to sleep deprivation that you get having children. And for those who have had children, you know exactly what I mean. It is this brain fog. It is and you can't stop it. It's not something you can actually walk away from. I mean, I know maybe some people do, but it's it's not something you can really step away from. And and it just constantly, constantly plays on you. And you, you might not get sick, but your energy is draining so low. And what I was finding, and for those who know me, I'm generally a very positive person and I'm very futuristic and optimistic. I was finding myself getting very negative I was getting quite cynical and I was starting to focus on the obstacles rather than the opportunities in front of me. Now, because of that, that energy will wear off to everyone else around you, whether it be prospects or clients or your team members, they might not directly see it, but it will have an effect. And so what I did is I knew I had a huge workload coming up in November and into the middle of December that I couldn't really take myself away from. But what I did decide to do was go, you know what? I know I'm only running at about 5% of what I can at the moment. And it's very dangerous. And if I keep going, I'm not going to make it to the end of the year. Or I could just take four days where I can step away from the home. And so I flew to Melbourne early for a keynote speaking uh, opportunity. And I went four days earlier, stayed at a friend's house, I got 10 hours sleep one night, nine and a half, nine, eight and a half, which is literally like 10 hours sometimes is the whole entire week um, worth of sleep when you got a little kid. And I was initially not going to do any work, but there was lots of things coming up. So I still had to do some, but I wasn't really forced into doing um, structured work each day. And that was enough for when I came back to you know, feel like I'm now at about 50%, which will get me through the rest of the year. When I came back, what was interesting, uh, my as Aroha got sick for the very first time, she's done well to go 10 months without being sick, and we were getting two or three hours sleep a night where she's literally screaming and struggling. And so it <laughs> hasn't been perfect, but we can't always control these things in our life. And so... For me, that was my first time going there. I've been extremely um, tired before. I have uh, gone to exhaustion, but I'd never gone into burnout. And so some of these things that were happening, like for me, food, I was starting to crave chocolate and ice cream and, and lots of it. So all the things I really shouldn't have been eating. So that was how I was fighting myself. And it was really difficult to keep a really clear mind. So I'm not sure if any of you have experienced things, but that's just my recent experience of it. So I really wanted to spend this time to try and see how we can prevent burnout. Um, I think one of the toughest times to ever try and do it is when you do have kids, because you can't always control everything in regards to your sleep. So let's have a look at from a, and when we look at burnout, and we look at energy management, it is both a employer and an employee thing. So you never blame the other person. Like employees do not blame your employer and employers do not blame the employees. Burnout is a choice on both sides. And so the choices we make can lead to situations where people can end up in burnout or they can prevent it. And so we both have responsibilities. So never kind of isolate one or the other. It's always both. We always have choices. Let's, let's dive into first kind of the top five causes of burnout from an employer point of view. These come from Gallup, who's the largest researching company in the world when it comes to culture, uh, engagement, leadership, and things around well-being. And so... Here's the top five. First one, unfair treatment at work. And this could be the way a manager treats someone. It could be behavior from someone else inside uh, the, the way the employees interact with each other. Number two, unmanageable workload. Yeah, who's had those times where <laughs> the workload just piles up and you're like, how am I going to do this? And so that, that quite often happens. Lack of role clarity can lead to burnout because people are, are trying to figure out what they need. It creates extra stress. 
lack of communication and support from the manager, and unreasonable time pressure. So these five things of what Gallup have uh, through their surveys have noticed as the top five causes for burnout from an employer perspective. From an employee perspective, this here is based, at, and it's actually very difficult to find much around this from an employee perspective, because a lot of the time, it is always focused on the employer when it goes to research around workplace burnout. However, as individuals, we need to take responsibility. Um, so I've gathered some information, then obviously looked at it. This is kind of more anecdotal from my perspective. What I feel are the top five causes of burnout from an employee perspective. And the first one here is very common. Don't have to be a parent, but it is sleep deprivation. It is either you're working late or you're watching lots of Netflix or you go out socializing and you're getting less and less sleep. And over time, that will start to wear you down. Um, obviously, if you're having children, like I mentioned earlier, that one there kind of happens without you trying. Um, compounding stress, and I'll look at compounding stress. So what I need to realize is stress is stress is stress is stress is stress. It could be uh, athletic stress, you know, sports stress. It could be home stress. It could be relationship stress, could be work stress. They all keep adding on top of each other. They're not separated. They are all stress. And once you start adding one on top of the other, then it can lead to a real compounding stress, which then depletes your energy levels and depletes things like hormones, et cetera, that you need to, to thrive. Your immune system drops, et cetera. The next one in here in regards to from an employee perspective is poor nutrition. Now, these things start to come into play. Quite often, you will see someone is sleep deprived, someone is stressed, then they start eating poorly. Or it could be the other way around. We eat poorly, which leads to inconsistent sleep, which can lead to compounding stress. So they all kind of apply into play with each other. Fourth one, lack of exercise. We Our exercise has huge effects on both our mental health and our physical health. And the hormones that it creates help stabilize us. And even that little bit of stress from exercise can also help build your immunity as well. Okay, so we just need to understand there are different types of stresses. Some are toxic and some are helpful stresses. And then the fifth one, limited close uh, social and close relationships. Now, you can take a screenshot of this if you like or can grab it out of the chat. This one here, a lot of people experienced for the very first time during COVID. And we saw a lot of burnout start to occur because of number five, that limited social and close relationship time. And sometimes when we get really busy and we get very focused and uh, our energy is depleting, we tend to go inside ourselves. So it's important that we keep those social connections up, those close relationships as long as we're not depriving sleep and and then and drinking too much alcohol, um, we and not eating well, then uh, that's really really important to include. And and obviously we see a lot of social and close relationship stuff happening around now with Christmas parties, end of year gatherings, Christmas etc. So we just got to be careful with those. We don't contribute to what may already be quite low energy levels by overdoing those social occasions. So just, just be mindful of that because it could set you off and then you end up spending the first part of the holidays that are coming up unwell, in bed, suffering, not wanting to do anything when, hey, you've got maybe a week, two, three, four weeks where you can really go and enjoy yourself. So let's come and have a look at compounding stress. So I want to come back to this. And let's, from a compounding stress point of view, let's have a look, okay, as a bit of an insight in, for me. So we had the baby, okay? So the stresses of sleep and you're always on all day, working from home. Uh, every time I step out of here, I'm still on. I don't get to kind of free the mind and relax because Araha is always wanting some time. Sleep, I talked about sleep deprivation. We've got business, I still got a business to run. You know, we're dealing with, Lots of things happening in from an economy point of view, uh, lots of disruptions in businesses, lots of change happening, transformation, which 
then can have some impacts on other businesses. Human resources, sometimes we need to, um, you know, we might need to hire someone. So we've got all those sort of extra stresses that may come in, good or bad, they still keep adding to the stress load. Uh, exercise, you know, for me, I wanted to exercise, but had to keep it at a low level. And if I did too much, then it was going to add too much extra stress. Mortgage, as we all know, inflation's gone up and we've got higher interest rates. So the mortgage payments get higher. You know, even though we can sustain it with our, our incomes, it's still a little bit of a stress there because you go, hey, you know what? I'm spending an extra 400 bucks a week than what I was a year ago. That, that can be a little bit stressful. I had uh, one of my ex-girlfriends actually pass away. So you add another stress load onto your mind, a mental fatigue. And then we've got my lawn and I decided I wanted to remove all the weeds in the lawn and I managed to pretty much kill the lawn. So there's another stress load that sometimes can add. So we need to kind of look at all the potential stresses that can be in our life and go, where can we reduce the stresses? Can we remove some of them for a little while if we start to feel ourselves getting quite energy depleted? Okay, talk quite a bit so far. Do we have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions so far before we dive into just some energy management strategies? Hopefully I'm not adding any more stress to your compounding stress loads. <laughs> so far. Beautiful. All right, we'll move on. Now, some of you have may, may have heard me say this before, but I believe that energy is the number one currency of all leaders. Oh, sorry, it is Thursday today, not Wednesday. <laughs> yes, it's Thursday. Um, energy is the number one currency in leadership. And so... Um, whether you are leading yourself or you're leading other people, energy management is your number one tool. And if you're not focused on what type of energy you are either projecting or the type of energy load you're placing on someone else or yourself, then we need to make sure uh, that we need to be aware and cognizant of that. And there are times where we will increase the load and we need to. Like we can't always maintain a low energy load <laughs> unless you've got so much money in the bank. You don't need to worry about working another day in your life and you lead a very relaxed lifestyle at the beach. Maybe you're going to hold pretty low. Um, but in most cases, it will fluctuate. And so we just got to try and minimize the big, the big high fluctuations of really high energy load um, and stress load where we sustain that for too long. We need to be aware of that. So we're going to have a look at three components. Some of you may have seen this with me before, but I'm going to approach it a little bit different today. So in energy management, we have three components. One is, uh, I believe you need to schedule your energy. This is a proactive one. We need to then focus our energy and then invest in your energy. So we need three key components here. And we're going to go, we're going to start with schedule your energy first. I want you to have a look at your calendars right now. And I'm really curious and I'd love you to pop into the chat and I want you to be honest. When you have a look at your calendars, how much percentage of the working week is currently filled with meetings? What percentage? Just kind of rough guess, having a look at your calendar. Is it 5%? Is it 20%? Is it 90%? What? Pop it in the chat. Where would you currently be sitting? 25% Megan, thank you. I'd love to hear from others, or oh, that was to me directly, Megan. Uh, Kieran, 20 to 30%, excellent. Ten percent Raywin, Jake, 15%, Charlotte, 30 to 40, 40% 40 Chloe and the team there. Is that collective, the team there in, in the uh, Pier 1 room? Okay, that's good. The greatest advice I ever got was to only schedule a maximum of 20% of your week in meetings. And the reason is there'll always be one or two that pop up and you also need to leave time to do real work. You know, that may be difficult if you're in hospitality, like some of you on the call, where you're literally meeting lots of customers. Um, but otherwise, see if you can try and keep it to 20% or below. 
Once you start going over that, you place extra load on those times you need to prepare, do deep work, um, whatever else you have in your role. So I think that's really important. Also think about how you schedule your energy over a day, a week, a month, a year, a career. And I like when we look at both from a sporting perspective and a corporate perspective, the three to one work to rest ratio is ideal unless you have really, really high stress loads. If you have high stress loads, you then need to do, it might even be less. It might be a two to one or a one to one. So what does that mean? If you work three and then you recover one or rest and recover one, that would be 45 minutes of kind of intense focused work, 15 minutes of either non, non high stress focused work or doing something else that allows you to recover in that time. Okay. And then repeating it as human beings, we are only able mentally to stay at a high performance mode for around 45 to 60 minutes before the decline starts to happen. Now, the beauty is it only takes 15 to 20, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, if you've had 45 minutes of focus work to get yourself back to high performance mode and hold it for another 45 minutes. Okay, if it's an hour, 20 minutes, and you can come back and do that. So I always kind of laugh is I when I look back, those who are smokers and take a smoko break, you actually got it sorted. Right? Every 45 minutes to an hour, you'd go outside, you'd, you'd do some socializing, you'd give the brain kind of a relaxation, and you'd talk about something else, and you literally went that three to one work to rest ratio. Unfortunately, you're probably doing some other harmful things that may even affect potentially getting to burnout or other problems in your body elsewhere. But that that phase, and when we work from home, we've got to be cautious of this because we can get really caught up in go, 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 and we don't actually step out and go for a break. I do it every hour. I go out. I either go and check that my lawn's regrowing. Um, I might hang out with Aroha. I, I might grab a drink of water. I sometimes may take a phone call and go for a walk just to break it up so that I can, uh, my energy is not continuing to deplete and I can go back to that high performance level. Really, really important. If you do it over a week, uh, sorry, over a month, then you really want three weeks, which could be more intense. You might have more projects, higher workloads, could be traveling. And then have one week where you just purposely don't schedule as many meetings. You may not travel, et cetera. So over a period of time, you can start to rebuild those energy levels. Um, even over an entire year, you might go three months that are fairly uh, more full on, one month that's a little bit more relaxed, might take some holiday time and repeat that three times. Um, my friend, Angripa, I love this. Every She takes CEO roles for five years only, then has one complete year off. And she's one year traveled the world on a bicycle. Another year, she's done her master's. Another year, set up a philanthropic organization. Now, we might not all financially be in that situation, but how can you give your mind a break, a career break, every couple of years rather than waiting until you're 65 or 70 and retire? To see how you can do it. Second one here, focusing your energy. Now, this here requires you to think about what are my priorities for the today and going, okay, here's 10 things I need to do, but I'm only going to write down three and here's in order of I need to do one, two, three. Try not to do all 10. Yep, you might need to do them, but just prioritize what's most important. Then think about focusing your energy and the intention of when you're going to walk into a room and meet someone else, when you're going to have a phone call, when you're going to do a piece of work, what is the intention you have for it? When we don't set intentions, our mind moves everywhere. We start getting complex, complex and confused rather than staying simple on what we need to do. So how can you focus your energy on prioritization and then on your intention of what you're going to get out of the activity or that the interaction with someone else? And the third one here, invest in your energy. Now, this comes back to the fundamentals of exercising daily. Now, that could just be walking 30 minutes. doesn't have to be training for a marathon. I, I, um, eating the right food, so fueling your body with the right food. So try and keep 80% natural foods 
and less than 20% processed foods. And then we need to free your mind. So what are those things you need to do during the day so that you can stop your mind from moving at 100 miles an hour? And that is not looking at your phone scrolling because your brain keeps spinning. You're going to fry your brain if you keep scrolling on phone. So is it going for a walk? Is it listening to music? Is it meditating? Is it just closing your eyes for a little while? What is it that you can just kind of reduce the, the brain functionality? Um, and then recovering with purpose. So, so that doesn't that can include sleep, which is rest, but then recovery is something that continues to rebuild your energy. And exercise can do that, meditation can do that. It might be a jigsaw puzzle. It could be um, knitting. Uh, it could be any sort of activity that doesn't require lots of brain function, like as in lots of neurons firing, but you can actually just allow the brain to recover from things that you normally do that are quite intense. Um, investing in your energy also in re involves removing anything that might contaminate uh, the workspace and the home space, so separating those divisions. For me, it's closing a door and then walking out into the lounge. It could be when I come home from work that instead of putting my laptop bag on the kitchen table, I put it away in a cupboard or a room so that it's separated from the home space. And so just making sure we can separate those. So some real key trip, uh, tips there to help set you up and try and prevent burnout. And hopefully you might be able to make some changes now just to get yourself energized before you go into the Christmas holiday season for those that have it in your part of the world. So remember to schedule your energy, focus your energy and invest in your energy. This will be the last time I see you um, on in this setting before we go into 2024. I wish you a safe, energizing and healthy time with family and close friends coming up towards the end of the year and, and celebrating the new year. And I look forward to seeing you all in 2024. For those that are looking for programs or support for next year, please reach out. More than happy to have a conversation and see how we can support your learning development needs and even your energy management so that you can shine in 2024.